later. She's a great I'm going for her. Do we have reports of this? has no authority over the school district other than voting their budget up or down. Thank you so much. And we understand your passion. And we want to make sure that you use that energy to direct it to somebody that can make that change. So we need to make sure that your thoughts and your day after gets articulated. Because what you're saying is the current format that asks for a yay or nay needs to probably have a little bit more power. All right? So let's do that. Let's put some teeth in your act and make sure that we're asking the right person to make the change. Because if you come and ask me to cook dinner, it ain't happening. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to the next question. And this is education. This is going to Mr. Malik Evans. How would you feel about military school or giving guns to security guards inside of schools Um, I think what 
what I would, would do and we would continue to do is to make those kinds of options available because they have not always been available. Uh, having the, the, the land, land bank has helped us to acquire properties that we've been able to make available to people. So there's more that we can do, but I think we're in a good place as far as making that happen. Thank you. And this is a question for one of the candidates. So this question is, what specifically would you do to support workers that are seeking a better living wage in our community? And uh, it looks like Mr. Gruber would like to answer that. A better living wage. A little bit more, more than enough to pay the RG. I mean, want something after that. <laughs> Get a little bit, yeah. okay? So actually, just this morning, I uh, got I, I was at a meeting with uh, Oasis over on Hart Street, the adult education portion of RCSD, dealing with their culinary program there. They have a fantastic culinary program, but the unfortunate part is that when the kids graduate or the adults graduate, they oftentimes end up in 975 jobs that actually contribute to the cycle of poverty. It's where, it's where people get caught chasing their tail, making 975 at places like McDonald's and Burger King's with very, very low ceilings. But meanwhile, the food industry as a whole has huge amounts of middle skills jobs, $15, $20 an hour jobs, at companies that surround us right now. The meeting was held at Palmer's on East Henrietta Road, right? Not in the city, admittedly, but Paul, Kip Palmer would, said right then and there, he could hire three, four people that day if they had a small amount of training in addition to what Oasis offered. We need to develop middle skills training programs, and it's not just in the food industry. Perhaps some of you have heard of uh, True Form Manufacturing, the work Tyrone Reeves has done with Yamtech. This, these, again, there, there are jobs out there. We do not need to have our jobs program as, as city council members be how do we attract the new factories and warehouses coming to town. There are jobs in our, in, in our community right now, and they pay a livable wage if we can find the appropriate training mechanisms to get there. And that spans all industry, and I would take the work I've done with food, they can bring that to council to help foster and facilitate those very programs. Thank you. Y'all got your seatbelts on. This is a question for our three incumbents. And the question is about criminal justice. And these folks in the audience would like to know, with all the years that you've been in office, why is it that we do not have a police accountability board already? <laughs> changes. What has been lacking is credibility that people don't trust it. They don't believe it. They can't see into it or through it. So we were sort of stuck with recognizing that there were many barriers to getting it done. And I think we needed this thorn. You know, truth be told, I think we just needed to, to have somebody just sort of push us along which is why I am absolutely confident that we're going to have it now. So, I would um, absolutely say that it has always been top of mind, and many of us, um, I will tell you, as far as the types of um, expertise in, in regards to negotiations and things like that, um, we are not experts. And so there are so many who have been recently providing more information in terms of the types of things that we can and cannot do that I think are absolutely helpful. But I would say that we have reviewed it a couple of different times, and I think it was about a year or two ago that we have um, we implemented a change on there to be able to provide a, um, an advocate through the process. Now. 
And my understanding is now that we've given that at least a year, even that needs to be changed at this point because the titling of that, that person helps you navigate the system as opposed to being an advocate. And so we are going through this learning process with everyone else in terms of the right things to do. And so I would say we are not, not trying here. Um, and so I think there's an opportunity, obviously, to get much better here, but we need everyone to assist us in the process. Hi, Dana, Dana Miller, City Council Vice President. I, I would just like to say that um, where we are now is part of, of a continuum. At first we had nothing, and then we had the Civilian Review Board, and now for the very first time, City Council has used its subpoena power to actually investigate a police abuse situation. And believe me, we sat in, in a locked room and reviewed video, audio, all kinds of, uh, of evidence for the very first time. And now we're looking at a police accountability board. So this is something that is not something we haven't thought about or considered. It's a continuum and we're moving to the point where we will have something that we believe will be better. And that's, that's where we're headed. But it's, you know, I think what we've seen is that a lot of these situations have happened in the past. The change now is that we have much more evidence. Everybody has a video camera. Everybody posts this automatically as soon as, soon as something happens. So we've been able to see and understand a lot more about what's really been going on for a very long time. And as we move to that next step on the continuum, hopefully the Police Accountability Board will take us where we need to be. Thank you. In, in my role as a nurse, I, I'm supposed to assess patients and kind of figure out what's going on. Sometimes y'all come to the doctor and y'all say y'all head hurt, but you really know what's going on, right? And y'all make me figure out what's going on. So when I pitched this question, I noticed that all of the candidates started like, I got an answer. So you all are going to get one minute each. That's it. One minute to tell us why we don't got it. Because I got a feeling y'all got a whole different answer than what the incumbent said. So we're going to start with the first candidate on that end and make our way down here to get only one minute. What? Why we don't got it? We know we did it a long time ago. Why is it not there? Yes. This has been a problem since 1992, right? That's when it was started. It should not have taken this long for it to get to this process. It, it should not have. So therefore, all the people before you, before you, before you, this was an ongoing problem, and it's, and it's not going and it's not going to be solved right now. Because if it was, it would have it would have been solved. We wouldn't be here talking about. So we wouldn't be a board to have right now. Thank you. Mary, Mary Lucian. So that thorn that you talked about, Loretta, that thorn is you all. And it's been neglected from people in public office, with deep respect, to reach out to the community and build the public support for the things that we want to move in office. I'm an activist and a community organizer. And we have been showing up to city council every month since March, fighting in support of Visionary Square. And now all of a sudden, that's an issue. And even in the case of the subpoena power, to look at the case of Ricky Bryant, that was because we put a thorn in the side of our elected officials. And what would it be like? What would it be like to elect activists and community organizers to city council that can work and, and co-strategize with the public? How many issues could we move forward that are, are not moving in our, in our social areas? Can we get child care? Can we get police accountability board? Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, <laughs> Where the money at, William? The, 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 I agree with everything that's been said, but I'm going to add this. It, this is what I learned in uh, the county legislature. We are supposed to be working for you, okay? And what happens a lot of times is this community, and many communities, are reactive instead of proactive. And, and what we're seeing now is a national movement, Black Lives Matter, different, we've seen so many grotesque things 
on social media that I see a movement that's happening nationally. And I'll give you an example. The public defender situation that we had in the Monroe County, when we were getting ready to hire a new public defender without the community support, and before we had a community process, a committee like this being asked about done here. When the community came down, Sister Grace was arrested at that meeting. When the community came down, or he tried to arrest her, when the community <laughs> came down in force, right, things started to change. What you're doing, that's why I say we have to have leaders that that are strong and courageous, okay? And it's gonna take the entire community. And that's why I think it has happened before, because we have, you guys, have been empowering us now. Time. Uh, I just want to show of hands. How many of you have been a civil servant, worked in a union, been in labor? Just show of hands. How many of us have family members who have been in one of those jobs? Hey, so we look around this room. I think that that's the conversation we need to have. We recognize that this is a collective bargaining agreement and that is a barrier. We need to work collaboratively and I think there's been some struggles with that. We need to recognize that people's jobs are part of this. And we need to understand that there are state laws and there are civil service laws that are in place that we need to work through. And it's, I'm not giving anybody a pass, but I'm saying it seems difficult. And I think we've got a collective desire strong enough now to start moving this forward and start advocating on a state level to fix the problem that exists. Thank you. So I make sure I have the question right. The question is, why do we not have it right now? Because ultimately, this conversation that we're okay. having tonight well, is about that. And so it certainly seems that it would be appropriate that if we allow our incumbents to answer it, that we allow our so candidates to answer. So I guess that's my answer. I just I would love to ask the incumbents. We have lots of experience. Two of them are finishing their second term of eight years. Uh, a third one is going into their fourth term. And we went in front of the Democratic Committee the day before Easter, and I brought up my computer IT experience, and I had the police accountability report in my hand, and then all of a sudden everybody started talking about, oh, let's, let's, this is a great idea, the police accountability board. Syracuse had their board installed in 2012. So there's been a lot of opportunity for the incumbents to put this board in place, and it seems kind of ironic that in late August, 20 days before a primary election, Lo and behold, they're going to introduce legislation for a police accountability award. Wow! So, that's my answer. Ask the incumbents. Because I don't know. Personally, I'm not on council yet. But I can tell you, if I am on council, I will introduce legislation for the board. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Doreen Hall, and so I'm going to suggest we do something different, right? The only reason it hasn't happened is because they don't care, right? I'm a guy from the Plex Plymouth Exchange Neighborhood Association, and we've been working on a development project, just like many other neighborhoods working on development projects. And I'm running for city council because of my involvement and in not seeing city council respect neighborhoods' needs or questions or wants. So my whole goal is to hope that you guys do something different. If you want a better city council, we cannot have the same people in place. We have to vote different. When I mean vote different, vote different. If you vote different and someone doesn't have their seat, they will start respecting city council. Vote different. Thank you. I would guess that it hasn't happened yet because it's hard. I didn't decide to run for city council because I thought that legislating would be easy. I'm sure it's very difficult. And I'm sure that some of the decisions that were made were hard, but I will tell you that I am still shocked that the subpoena power wasn't used for the first time until now. Uh, that seems to me to be something where there has been, I mean, this, this study is, is a litany of cases that should have had some significant review process and there should have been subpoena well before now. And that is one of the things that I, I, I am truly surprised. But I also want to go back to saying that this, and this is a hard thing. I want to reference the Syracuse study again, which was referenced consistently here. Right now in Syracuse, or just recently in Syracuse, their 11 person board was down to six, and then it was down to eight. This is hard work, not just for the legislators, but it's also going to be hard work for the people in the room here. 
And if we want to do this well, we have to really band together as a community and make sure that we're doing it all in and that in two years from now, we don't stop and have an eight-person board and can't find people to fill those remaining seats. Thank you. Thank you to your daughter again, just in case anyone forgot. <laughs> so anyway, um, I feel that the incumbents are taking way too long and one of the attributes, one of the top attributes I would bring is that I would get job, I would get things done a lot faster. I think anything that's brought to city council should be done within four years. Completed, started, completed in four years. There's no excuse for that. One of the things I would bring and my top goal is to complete things in one term. If you can't do that, and they're going on over eight years now. So I'm saying you've got to be able to do things a lot faster in the city, and that's what I think we should have. Also, do something different. Vote different. Thank you. We November got four, seven. Just three more to rise. Thank you. I, I'll just be real brief. I, mean, I want to talk about this in a broader context, taking the politics out of it. In this country, when things predominantly affect the African American community, it very rarely gets the attention that it deserves uh, Say it. across the board. So, so, so these are larger issues than just the Rochester City Council or Police Accountability Board. You can look at it in education, you can look at it in health, you can look at it in criminal justice in particular. It, that, so though, that is important to keep that in mind as, as we do that. I am so happy that we're having a conversation about the Police Accountability Board. I don't want to look back, I want to look forward. My commitment to you is that we will work towards this and make it work. We have brilliant people in this community and around the country that can make it work. That's my commitment to you, but I think that we have to continue to have the larger conversations about structural and institutionalized racism that goes beyond. Yes. We should have a conversation after you run for office and all those things. It's only a small slice of it. So don't let us candidates come up here and, 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 and politics to you. It goes beyond this. I've been, I've been talking about these issues forever uh, beyond an election. So we have to have these conversations beyond um, city council. The day after. And the day after. <laughs> Chris Leeds again. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, I'm not running in the primary. I'll be on the ballot in the general election on the uh, Libertarian Party and Reform Party lines. Um, I think if, you, if you've ever heard Rochester's political class referred to as smug town, uh, there's a reason for that, and that is that we've had one party rule for a long time. It's a relatively small group of people that control the process and usually uh, end up deciding who the candidates are. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a bunch of people that are really buddy-buddy uh, buddy with each other and they don't want to rock the boat because everything is going well for them. And, you know, I think we need to shake things up. Uh, I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I don't uh, owe any favors to party bosses and I don't intend to play political games. And uh, if we want to send a message that, that change is necessary, I mean, you're going to have five votes for city council in November. Uh, you know, consider giving one or two of those votes to an independent candidate. And that, I think, would send uh, shockwaves to the establishment when we see the real change. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, Sean Dunley. Yes, um, if we go back, we got to go back. And once again, we can talk about it. I know it's a hard process to make these decisions, and I know everyone wants this accountability board to move forward. But it does begin with institutional racism. July 64 started here because it was beating us upside the head. Excuse me? Uh, but, but it happens. It happens. We got and this is what's working together. This is what creates that form. That happens. So together we can do this. We say, hey, I'm tired of you bashing me upside the head. Let's band together and make sure that council moves ahead and move our state forward so we know we're not going to get beat by government or cops again. We have to work together. It started with hitting us upside the head. And we're going to stop this together. All right? Thank you so much. Can spell it, please? Jennifer Bannister, J E N N I F E R B A N I S T E R. What do you think of this meeting? I think it's really helpful to have this conversation in public, uh, to hear everyone. I thought that um, probably it would have been good to hear more of the comparisons between 
the candidates, um, but for the most part, uh, this is just a topic that has not gotten the attention that it's needed, and so it took community people to put it there. And go. Oh, I don't know what I was saying, uh, so I'm okay. sorry. Uh, you were talking about uh, uh, the meeting. Just start it again, sweetheart. You can do it. My name is Kiara Johnson, K-I-A-R-A Johnson, J-O-H and S-O-N. All right, what did you think of the meeting? Um, as far as the meeting, I thought that it was really um, informative. I got to see whose uh, views that I agreed with and whose um, I was a little confused about or just didn't agree with flat out. Um, I did hear a lot about how they wanted to incorporate the youth in a lot of things and also even helping us get jobs, um, which is very important to me because as me being a black female and being young, it is very hard for me to get a job while trying to make sure I'm good in school and just all those other things. So just hearing those points of views from them and seeing how passionate they were about it, I am actually very happy that I came to this meeting because if I didn't come, I wouldn't have known that I actually liked some of these candidates a lot more than I thought I would. So I think this is really nice. I'll be sure to read your question. All right, thank you so much for going with the format. All right, this is going to the, to the panel, and we'll get somebody to raise their hand. This is a criminal justice uh, question. In addition to ensuring that police officers receive racial sensitivity training, what sort of plans are being made or should be in place to order or ensure that the LGBT citizens of Rochester are treated fairly? Well, as the openly gay candidate running for city council, I have lots of opportunity to talk to the LGBTQ community. One of the biggest challenges we face here in Rochester is with our transgender population. When uh, there's a great deal of training that's done in the police academy with our Rochester police in terms of interacting with trans uh, and LGBT community members. However, that training was shortened to half a day, which is not nearly long enough. Another issue that exists is the fact that uh, we have different policies between the city and the county. The city has a policy where you treat a member of the community in the gender they express. When that person is then taken to county jail, you're treated in the manner of a letter on your license. We know that there's a problem with poverty among the transgender community, and it is cost prohibitive for them to be able to change their name and gender legally. So what we have is women individuals who are expressing their gender as women being taken to jail and put in solitary confinement in men's prison because their license says the letter M. We need to address this. We need to work with our partners in the county. We need to work with the sheriff. And hopefully we can elect a democratic sheriff this year who can help us fix this problem as well. Thank you. And I want to do this, I want to do this question more justice because this individual went into more depth and you kind of hit on what the issue is and Specific, this, this is the latter part of this, specifically transgender women, and more specifically transgender women of color, it is too common that transgender women do not receive equal treatment by law enforcement. Many trans women walking down the street are assumed to be sex workers. Anybody on the panel would like to address that? Um, this person, in addition to equal treatment, would like very much for trans women not to be seen as sex workers. So I think that goes back to that comment I made about training. When we took a training from being a full day to cutting into a half day, there's a lot of material that's left out of that. And I think that the other thing we need to address is the fact that training is not a one-time event. As a city school district employee, as a teacher, we know that adult learning theory says we don't just teach it once. We need to practice it in the field and get feedback. 
They think we can do the same thing with our police officers. We can provide ongoing training. Thank you so much, and I, I think it would do us some justice to find out. Um, certainly, if there's anyone on the panel that knows if there is a policy that when a person is um, incarcerated that they have to be um, placed in custody with what's on their driver's license. And does any of the incumbents know it? Is that a rule here in the city? That is the rule. That, that's, the, that's the city law I'm hearing from the audience is that that is, that is the law, which means we got to change the law. That's what that means. It's not city law, they go to county prison. Mm -hmm. It's county jail, county policy. Okay. Goes back to those Republicans who gotta get out of office. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, Sister Grace, there is a campaign for you to run for city council. to work to improve, I just want to know if there's going to be any room for youth participation at any time. When, how are we going to hear the voice of the youth? I see Mr. Dunwoody going for that one. So we're going to start down here, we're just going to make our way down. Make our way down. I'll start with you, Mr. Dunwoody, go ahead. Mr. Dunwoody. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, Sean Dunwoody, this has been the, the, the the driving force of why I'm engaged and why I want to be part of city council is to actually engage our youth in the process. Currently, we have our male youth advisory council. They also have a youth voice one vision, but we need to reach more young people to have them engaged in the process of our city, understanding its structure, understanding their role. They're the next, they're the next generation that is going to take over and be here. It would be fantastic to have uh, some 18-year-olds, some 16-year-olds in here engaged in this process to see what's happening, how it's going to shape their future. When I'm out there talking to young people, I'm like, this is a very important position to be in for all of us going forward because we represent you. And we want you at that table. We want to be able to hear your concerns because they're the ones that's on the corner that's getting harassed every day. They're the ones that's out there. So let's get them engaged and ask them what's going on. How can we support them and have the backbone structure that they need? questions that are coming now, I may not get to, but I will, with our team here, ensure that these questions um, get out and we don't get a chance to address them and perhaps we can get them answered out for when we have an exception. Go ahead. Right. Oh, Chris Lees again. Um, yeah, I absolutely think that we need to have young people get involved in the political process because too many young people don't vote. They don't vote, they're not registered to vote, they're not paying attention uh, to issues that are going to affect them very soon. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not on the city council, but there has, on the school board, there's actually a, a student representative. It's not a, a voting position, uh, but it's, you know, an opportunity to, to bring some input in. And I think something like that would work well in the city council. I mean, certainly, I, in, any opportunity we have to engage young people in the political process, we should take advantage of. Like, I, I would, if, if I was on the city council, I would love to, to hear from young people. I would love to get letters or emails or, or phone calls or, or get, get them to come to meetings. I, mean, I think what would be a great, a great idea is if we could do that through our schools and organize uh, something in the nature of a field trip where the school could sponsor students to come in to city council meetings and, and witness them and see what's going on. Um, so and, you know, if anyone else has any more ideas about how we can get young people involved, I'm certainly open to hearing it because that's something Thank that you really Thank you so need. much for that response. And as we move into our, our last question before we close out for the evening, how many of you remember the case of Chase Coleman? Chase Coleman was a gentleman with autism. He was a part of a racing team and he was racing in Cobb's Hill. Boy, oh boy, did he have a whole lot of day afters. And so this question from our audience is asking any of the candidates, how would you address police accountability in working with people with mental health challenges and special needs, i.e. autism, especially persons of color. We're gonna have uh, Mary and Millie Lupian and Willie Lightfoot answer that. So they both really know what the time is, but 
Um, I worked at St. Peter's Soup Kitchen for many years, and we deal with a lot of people who have mental illnesses. And the police do not have relationships in the neighborhood to know who those individuals are, and they treat them all as criminals. And I have witnessed some terrible things with people who I know are not dangerous, but have been harassed and abused at the hands of police. And we absolutely have to reach out in, in, the way, in the same way that we have to have racial bias training, we have to have LGBTQ safe space training, we also have to have training to, have, to help officers understand the signs of mental illness and to completely engage with them in a different way. And to go further, when we have police in our neighborhoods who are building relationships with the, with the people who live there, and they're getting out of their cars and they're on the streets, they're going to know these individuals because they're going to have a relationship and a personal um, uh, experience. And the people that know and love... This will be in your time. Thank you. Mr. Lightfoot, to wrap up the last response for us today. Thank you. I train, 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 train. I'm a fireman for 20 years. We get autism training. We get mental, uh, people with mental health or disability training. We get it every year. It's a yearly training that we all have to go through because as, as a, emergency first responders, we're responding to these homes all the time. We run into people that have these type of issues and we get the training to know how to deal with it. As a, as a city council person, this is something else we can look into. Coding to 911 dispatchers. We can get special codes to the 911 dispatchers that can get the dispatch to the first responders, the police and the fire, to let them know that they're dealing with this type of individual and to how to proceed going forward. Those are things that can be done. Immediately, as a simple call to the 911 dispatch. Thank you. Thank you. So, on behalf of the members of the Police Accountability Board Organizing Committee, which includes my sorority, Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated, Rock asks, Enough is Enough, Facing Race, Embracing Equity, GRCC, Rochester Coalition for Police Reform. I'd like to thank each of the candidates and our incumbents for coming out tonight to join us in a conversation about police accountability. I want a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For letting us know where you stand on these issues. And um, it is my responsibility to let you know we got you on tape. <laughs> But we are honored that you took the time to be here. I want to once again thank the social action chairs for Delta Sigma Theta, which is Dr. Gail, Dr. Gail Harrison, Dr. Donna Harris, and all the members of the social justice. When we started tonight, we talked about this night being dedicated to those men and women that have lost their lives. In their caskets lay one body, but as you all know, they took many, 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 many others with them to the grave. Let us not forget the day after. Thank you. If you would like to see the report that people have been talking about, I have a few copies up here in the front, but you can go to enoughisenough.rocus.org. Enoughisenough.rocus.org. Thank you so much, everyone. On your way out, remember to give the valuation survey to the ladies in red with the little bit.
from people who are not afraid to get up and say what needs to be said. Uh, I was hoping to hear more about the, the extreme poverty in Rochester. I was hoping to hear about the lack of education that children were getting. I know it was aimed for police, you know, a civilian review, but I think there's so much more we need to do if we don't get to the basic problem of what is, what is really ailing our community, which is racism and the poverty in our city, then we're not going to move. We need strong leadership, and I don't, I didn't see, really see the strong leadership tonight. Sometimes it's going to have to take the community to get the harder conversations going, and uh, this is one that's needed to be had for a long time. So that's that. Barbara Lacker Ware, 
um, and Betty Hancock to say uh, their advice to you. Thank you so much again. Good evening. The next speaker is uh, Barbara Lacker-Ware. She is the chair of the Police Accountability Board Organizing Committee, and we've asked her to say a few words. Hi there. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you especially to our city council candidates for coming. We really appreciate it. This is really a, a very uh, big event. Rochester for since the 1960s, really. There has, has been a rise and fall of momentum and, and uh, organizers working on police accountability over the years. Recently, uh, a couple of us wrote a report on looking at 15 years worth of data on police accountability, or really the lack of police accountability in Rochester, looking at police department, Rochester Police Department records and civilian review records and finding really that uh, over the past 15 years only 2% of cases of complaints, civilian complaints against the police department for uh, excessive use of force, only 2% of complaints have been sustained by the Rochester Police Chief and we have no idea what discipline has been enacted but we know that there hasn't been much. So we're glad to have you here. We want to talk about police accountability. We're making it an issue. Uh, well, it is an issue, obviously. Everybody's here tonight. And uh, we want to make sure that you're aware that we've been working on many fronts to get, raise awareness about this. We know that the city council already is looking at it, and we appreciate that very much. We hope that our candidates uh, are all informed. We know that they each have received a report, which if you want the report, I can give you a copy uh, after the program. I want you to look around at all of these cards that are on the walls and up on the balcony and on the table here and across the front. There are some people on the floor of the stage if you council candidates want to look at the floor of the stage and, and up there. There are 2,000 cards signed by police accountability voters. Now what that means, it does not mean that they are endorsing any single candidate. It means that they are voting for candidates who endorse police accountability. And specifically, or hopefully, including uh, the specific uh, results of our ordinance and our study, which Betty is going to talk about in a minute. But thank you for coming and uh, look forward to hearing what everybody has to say. Uh, thank you, Barbara. In your program, we can see that the next item on the agenda is why is an independent police accountability board vital? Now, for me, that question is very easily answered. We need to be able to have a system that allows us when we make a complaint so that we can feel that there is a viable, trustworthy, transparent system that allows our complaints to be addressed. Um, Betty Hancock, the Social Justice Chair for Rock Acts, will now give us more information to the document. Thank you and good evening. The Police Accountability Board Organizing Committee's purpose is to address community concerns regarding police improprieties in Rochester, especially the use of excessive force. After countless meetings to establish and implement our goal, the committee enlisted the help of hundreds of volunteers. The volunteers, members of local organizations and congregations, are instrumental in helping to enlighten Rochesterians of this initiative. They are responsible for informing the citizens of our voter card engagement campaign, which Barbara just mentioned. They attended local festivals, rain or shine and have this door to door in our neighborhoods. They are all determined to get the message out and of being part of the solution for change. We are calling on Rochester City Council to establish a police accountability board that would be an independent department of the city with a paid administrator and investigator. 
The board would conduct its own investigations separate from the police. It would have the power to subpoena for testimony and evidence, and it will have the final determination in the discipline of officers and make recommendations to the city council in police policy and procedures. In conclusion, based on feedback we received as we were in the community doing our citizen engagement activities, we believe that the Police Accountability Board is a vital step in making Rochester a safer and more unified community. Thank you, Ms. Hancock. Our facilitator for the forum is none other than Nurse Teresa Bowick. You may know her as your neighbor of many years here in Rochester. You may know her as the staunch community advocate for healthy eating through her book, Collard Green Curves. You may have even seen her on the Steve Harvey Show. Hundreds of kids and adults know her as the bike lady the founder of the extraordinarily successful Conky Cruisers. Conky Cruisers. She saw a need in our community and she addressed it. She will be using her exceptional talents as an educator, medical professional, and community advocate to be the, to be the facilitator for this evening's City Council Candidates Forum. Please welcome Teresa Bowen. serve as your facilitator tonight, but can we please give Dr. Gail Harrison a round of applause. What a fantastic job she's done putting this event together. And I am so happy to be here tonight to set a trajectory for a new outlook on how we are going to deal with police accountability in Rochester. Aren't you excited about that tonight? We should be excited about that tonight because we're going to set the tone in this room tonight. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our incumbent and our candidates. And so when I call your name, if you would be so kind as to wave to our fabulous audience or stand, I'm going to start with the president of city council, Loretta Scott. Alicia McCuller, Kenneth Jackson, 
Louis de Villa, Willie Carter, Craig Hurd, Lawrence Rogers, Patricia Thompson, Hayden Blackman, Calvin Green, Vander Davis, Israel Iziadino, and Richard Gregory Davis. And tonight, I'm going to be presenting our incumbents and our candidates with two questions. But I want to give you all a lens. You know how the lens is you needed for the solar eclipse? I'm going to give you a lens in which I'd like you to answer these questions by. And this lens is titled, The Day After. Because that's the day that never makes the news. The day after a person in Rochester is killed at the hands of a policeman. It don't make sense. The day that the grandfather has to tell his young grandson, your mama, Alicia, she ain't come home no more. And that life of Ryan, for all those years after, that don't make the news either. I want you to think about these questions and that this community, the day after, when the policeman is put on paid administrative leave and the victim's families are starting a GoFundMe page to pay for the burial expenses. I need you to think about the day after and after and after and after and what it means for Rochester. So if you don't mind, can you wear those lenses for me as I present the questions to you? So in the police accountability report, it's asking you to look at the things that we believe can truly make a difference. If this board could have some accountability over independence, the power to investigate, subpoena power, and the power to discipline. Where are the timekeepers? Okay, so they each have two minutes. Okay, so at the one minute mark, what will happen at the one minute mark? You will see this. And then at two minutes, and then do I have to say <coughs> at any point? Okay, all right. So we're gonna start off and we're gonna start with the current incumbent and the president of our current city council and have her to answer this question. And, and help us to understand why these things can happen and what roadblocks you see to the proposal. How would you address this? Ms. Lewis. Thank you. I want to use a portion of my two minutes to... Okay. <laughs> I want to use a portion of my two minutes to turn on the microphone. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Okay. I want to use a portion of my two minutes to recognize and thank those who put this report together. Barbara Lapaware, uh, uh, Mr. Forsyth, Reverend Stewart. Uh, someplace in the Bible, there's somebody who had a thorn in their side. And in many respects, this report provides that thorn. The situation we have is not a new one but we've not had enough of a thorn to get us moving, and that's what is happening with this report. I want to tell you that I am committed to ensuring the creation of an accessible, credible, accountable, transparent police, I'll say civilian review board. There are many elements that can work, but there are some that frankly are not going to work. Um, there has to be the same level of enthusiasm and determination to change some of the laws that govern the way we handle this right now. All of you probably know about 50A. That governs the way that police discipline is handled. Additionally, we have a union contract that many of the items that are in this report will have to be negotiated. Negotiation means you give up something to get something. So we will definitely have to find out what kinds of things, what is, what is, what is that? This is the orange, yellow, One minute. Okay. <laughs> we'll definitely have to have a community.
community consciousness about what we're willing to give up in order to get some of the things that we want and, and the fact that we absolutely must have. This is not our first attempt at this, but it definitely is the most intense. It's the most promising. And I do believe that we will be achieve much of what it's in this report. Thank you. And we're just going to make our way right down the aisle and then coming towards me. So we're going to start. I can't see who's sitting next to Mrs. Gossett. Thank you, sir. If you could just address it and we'll come this way and then I'll interject and provide some insight as we go along. Thank you. My name is Barney Ratchford, and I've seen enough death in my life, time, with friends being killed. Not so much by police, but I do understand the point of the day after, and it's probably even worse if it was a police officer that killed a friend. Uh, one thing that my mother always tells me, if you don't condemn it, you condone it. So, for all this time that y'all been fighting to get this, that means that, that means that the city or the administrators have condoned it. There's no reason for this to have been going on this long. There's no police officer that should be getting paid after they do something such as that. Nowhere in this city or this country should it be allowed. Therefore, this board should happen, and it should have happened a long time ago. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Jackie Ortiz. So um, I think the question you were talking about was the barriers and some of the things we see there and our suggestions to combat them, correct? Correct. When we're looking at the police accountability board, they're basically asking for four things. They want independence. They want power to investigate. They want subpoena power and power to discipline. And what we know that there are some union rules, there are some laws, is like police have the HIPAA of the medical field where there's just certain things we ain't never gonna know. Well, we wanna remove the HIPAA, okay? <laughs> so some of those things are in the way, and so the thought process is if we know what the barriers are, how can we collectively move them? Who do we need to call? So some of the things that obviously uh, our president had already mentioned in terms of the things that you had just reiterated. Um, so we will definitely need to work with, in concert with our union leadership, but we also need to be talking to our state partners. Because in order for us to be able to make some of these changes, as our president alluded to, we really are going to need some advocacy at the state level. So that will really require all of us to be working together to make that happen. Some of the more specific barriers, assuming that we can get through most of that, the things that I see as some potential um, barriers for us is the actual appointments. The board uh, proposal calls for 11. Um, it is obviously a very large combination of election and uh, elected and appointed. Um, there are some specific requirements to those, and I see some potential issues with the requirement of there being absolutely no one involved with prior law enforcement or any type of background. And the reason I say that is because as an elected official, I'm not sure if we can dictate who can have what type of background if they are elected. So I think that that might possibly have to be modified or we might change the way in which uh, we decide to put these members on that particular board. One of the other things that I think is we haven't received any estimated costs yet. In order for us to officially budget for something like this, we are going to need a fully detailed plan in terms of the estimated costs for us to be able to take this on. And the final thing is the training aspect. We want absolutely no involvement from RPD based on the proposal for training um, or any of that. So we are definitely going to have to figure out an RFP or some sort of mechanism for us to be able to find a, a company or set of companies to be able to provide the intensive um, training that's required here, whether it be um, police investigations, civil, civil law, a number of different things that will be required. So there are barriers, and I absolutely think there are ways for us to combat it, but we're gonna have to take them piece by piece. Okay. Now, I don't know if this is coming to that, just because some of the questions that, items that she brought up, it kind of triggered some other questions um, for me, in that when we talked about how much money. So 
Whoever the note taker is, write this down. Is there any way we can have $200,000 to start with? About $200,000 to start with. I mean, that's I mean, what it costs. If we're just looking at a number to start with, no. and we put a number on it, who do we pre present that number to and say, okay, this particular item costs $200,000 from what the research shows, okay? And we say that to city council. How do we get that then into the discussion or for it to become a line item to move forward? Uh, so all of the different types of items that we would end up putting in must go in the city's annual budget. So that would have to be something that the administration would put into the budget and then we would work together. We have all day budget hearings in the month of June to be able to go piece by piece. In order for that to get into the budget, the city administration will need an itemized listing, whether it be um, hours, whether it be materials, whether it be, so it really has to be very specific. And the administration puts it in the budget during the public hearings and we would actually then really kind of take it and, and tear it up. All right, y'all write that down. All right, yes. Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm, I'm Dana Miller. I'm currently Vice President of Rochester City Council. Thank you so much for having this uh, event tonight. How many people here have ever been pulled over by the police? Okay. All right, so I'm not alone. <laughs> but how many people have ever felt nervous and, have, and fear for their life when being pulled over? I only I see mostly... African American. Thanks. Okay, I'm just saying. Oh, okay, there, and you. A light skinned African American. Okay, so, so I, I, have a, I have a son. He's 32 years old. He worked at a job. We got off at 2 o'clock every morning, and he was pulled over every night on his way home from work. And he, had to, he started wearing his badge, keeping his windows down, so that when they pulled him over, he could show him his badge and say, I'm on my way home from work. This is, this is crazy. Uh, when Nurse Bork read the name, she read the name of Richard Gregory Davis. I grew up right next door to Greg Davis on Jefferson Terrace. Spent my whole life pretty much with Greg Davis. What we don't know about Greg Davis, he's been through a lot of trauma in his life. He lost his brother. His second brother was in prison for 25 years. He lost a nephew. So this trauma is a part of the challenge that we have to deal with. So something has to be different. We give the police great power, but as we know, with great power comes what? Great responsibility. So we have to have that responsibility. Something must be different. The number of known situations has changed dramatically with cameras. In fact, the best gift I gave my kids, my sons, was a dash cam. Because we all need a dash cam now, just so we can keep an eye on what's happening. Well, something has to be different. This report showed that too many names showed up too many times, the same people over and over again. So independence, yes. Power to investigate, yes. Subpoena power, yes. Discipline, that has to be negotiated, as we've heard, and that's very important. And roadblocks, the training that we've talked about will take a long time. We've got to understand that. We need to include youth. Youth have to be a part of this. And uh, I'll Just talk about that later. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mary Lupin, and I want to thank everyone for being here today. Thank you to the organizers and the authors of the report. And thank you for realizing that this is an important forum to have about issues that are important to our community and to hold your elected officials accountable and those who wish to become your elected officials. I fully support an independent police review board with the power to investigate, the power to subpoena, and the power to discipline. Because without those three things, we will continue to have a police department that is not being held accountable for their abuses in the, commu in the community, like in the cases of Ricky and Betty and Phyllis. And we must address the root of this problem, which is institutional racism and the fear that it creates. And on council, I will introduce legislation to mandate racial bias training, not only for the police, but all city officials, because we need to understand this bias in ourselves. And the biggest roadblock that I can see is the stakeholder buying and convincing those who will be judged by this and held accountable that this is in their best interest. This will make their jobs easier and make the community safer by breaking down this fear and building trust in the neighborhoods. So thanks again for the opportunity to speak. My name is Mary Rupian, and I hope to earn your support. Thank you. Good evening, everybody.
Good evening, Willie. All right. I think um, I want to thank everybody again for um, me, uh, allowing us to be here. And I want to say that, you know, by being so many candidates and by us not having near enough time to tackle this type of complex issue, that the thing, what do you want to know? You want to know, do I support this? Yes. What will I do if you elect me to city council? In my platform uh, pillars, if you go to my website, willylifehood.com, my first 100 days in office, I will hold meetings like this. We have to continue to have communication about this topic. That's how we're going to push it forward. It's easy to have these conversations when people are running, because they're going to come because they want your vote. But what are they going to do after, the day after? I'm saying, I'm going to continue the conversation. And then we can tailor how this thing is going to look. I agree with everything else everyone has said. You got to have all those things in place. There's contracts. I'm a fireman. I work with the police officers every day. They have a tough job. I've had my own interactions with them. I've worked in one of the most impoverished neighborhoods in this community. I'm telling you, we have to continue the conversation. So it's collaboration, it's cost, it's community, and it's conversation. God bless you. Good evening, I'm Matt Judah. Uh, again, I want to, just like everybody else, thank the organizers, thank the writers of the report uh, for putting this together and having us here tonight. I would suggest that it would be hard for any of us who is a liberal or progressive to find one of our friends who is also a liberal or progressive and say, it's not a problem. We have a system that's broken, it needs to be fixed. That being said, I've had several meetings with the organizers and writers of the report and I support the concept of creating a new process for the review board. But I've also brought several questions up that I still need to be addressed. And those questions I'm going to be meeting with Barbara and Ted, hopefully this coming week, to have some of those answered for me. In terms of the four tenants with independence, I think it's important that we have an independent board because it provides checks to what we are currently doing. Um, and the training that is implied underneath that tenant also is very important. We need to make sure that people on this board are, are adequately trained. The power to investigate and obtain the records of the PSS department are very, very important to this process. The ability to subpoena is critical to solving these issues. Um, and then the power to discipline, being able to make a recommendation to the chief, as outlined in the proposal, is a vital part of this as well. In terms of barriers, I agree with some of my colleagues up here. Uh, clearly, we have issues with state law. We have issues with the contract that we need to address. And it's going to require collaboration with the Locust Club and ongoing conversations so that we can meet somewhere and have a conversation about this. Some other issues I have regarding this is follow-through. If you look at the current legislation that exists, one of the biggest problems with it is we are not doing what it says. We are not appointing a board consistently. And if we aren't going to follow through on that, we need to ensure, and all of you who are here today, need to hold accountable any of us on council once legislation is passed, that we're actually following that legislation, and that's critical. The third part that I have concerns about is the representation on that board. I know that we've moved from the idea of being elected to appointed by community groups. I want to ensure that the community groups that are appointing representatives on the board are representative of the community as a whole. Well. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, uh, just want to say thanks for having me. I am not Andrew, unfortunately couldn't make it today, but I came instead to uh, read a short uh, statement here. So, I want to start this out by saying that I've spoken with a lot of people in our community about this proposal. All of them support having a more transparent review process in place. I've also spoken to a number of police officers in our city who have served for many, many years, and I think what doesn't get discussed very often is the point of view of the officers on the street. The officers who I've spoken to support the proposal, and here's why. They know that there are bad cops out there, and they know that they're going to get caught. This will help to take care of those bad cops. They also know that there are a lot of good cops out there, and a transparent process will protect the good cops and help clear their names and reputations appropriately. The police I've spoken with see this as a way to protect themselves and a way to protect the community the same way that body cams can help do that. The community feels the same way. They want transparency. The components of the PAB proposal are simply common sense. Having an independent body performing audits is a common practice for businesses across the world. It helps guarantee objectivity and fairness. So the power to investigate and subpoena are an absolute must. 
So how can you make a decision without the full picture? Why would, why would anyone want you to? If you went to trial and were innocent, would you want the judge to know all of the facts that prove your innocence? Lastly, is the power to discipline. At first I was wary of how this would work and even somewhat skeptical. But once I learned that a rubric would be created so that there are very clearly defined punishments for actions and that there is a scale of severity, uh, I was on board. This sets expectations and a clear direction for success and what the punishment is for failure. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Tom Hasbin. Thank you very much for inviting us here tonight, for being here. Uh, I bring a unique perspective to this question. I've been a computer security specialist for 17 years. That's basically the police department of the internet. When I got started in this field over 17 years ago, this was the early days of the internet. There wasn't much thought to security. You couldn't even buy stuff. You might go to an airline website and they would say, oh, you want to book a ticket? Give us a call, right? Nobody knew what to do with the internet. So as things evolved and hackers started getting out there, they came up, when I got in this field, a basic principle called separation of duties. Go ahead and Google it. I'll just read you the brief definition. No single person is given the authority to execute two conflicting duties. And when you think about it, in my field, it's common knowledge that there is separation of duties. As a security person, I often approve accounts, but I don't actually create them. Creating them would be a conflict. The police department lacks separation of duties. When you think about body cameras, that officer not only is wearing the camera, but also controls when the camera turns on and when the camera turns off. That violates separation of duties. A basic premise. If an officer has an issue and there's, and there's a hearing, but yet his friends on the force and the police chief are in charge of that hearing, that is failure of separation of duties. So I can tell you, someone that comes from the IT field, I have no problems with separation of duties. I go through audits all the time, and I know what my role is and what I can and can't do. And we need to educate the police that this is a basic concept that they violate every day. And that's what I promise you that I will bring to the table. Thank you as so much as, for that. You're Separation welcome. of duties. Separation of duties. Okay. As far as barriers. Time is up. Oh, time is up. Okay, maybe I'll get some barriers in the Q&A. Thank you very right. much. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Dorian Hall, and uh, I was just sitting here thinking about this uh, question, and it's very dear to me because I'm one of the young African Americans who experienced this at first hand. I am a, a DJ and I worked in the East End, and I was pulled over by a black cop. The black cop pulled me over and actually called maybe seven other cops to my vehicle. And I'm nervous and scared because didn't do anything wrong, just left in the vent DJing. And they search my vehicle. I'm worried about if they're going to put drugs in my car. I'm worried about if they're going to do something to me uh, that I can't come back from. And all I can think is, you know, what do I have to protect me from someone who is a corrupt cop or a bad cop to protect me? So they go through my car. They from AJ, I'm upset, they let me go, I go to a parking lot and I cry because it was a black cop. I was surprised a black cop pulled me over and it brought over, I would say, seven white cops. So I support this police accountability board because it's a tool, it's a tool that we need, that I can have in my pocket to protect me and to hold cops accountable. When I work with the police officers for the uh, endorsement, they said they're going to look into it and they're looking to do a police accountability board. Their biggest issue was they weren't looking for community members to be on this police accountability board. 
So I suggested to them, you add lawyers, you add, you add people who've been affected, you add community people, and you also add officers. You make this committee. It looks like we are out of time. And so, thank you. And thank you so much. And I'm glad that you talked about the tears. Because remember when I told you earlier and asked you to look at this through a different lens about the day after? Nobody talks about those tears that are shed day and day and day and day after the incident. It's those tears is the reason why we're here tonight. Because there is the day after. Next. My name is Mitch Bruiser. Thank you all for having me and thank you to the organizing committee for not just organizing this but making it a central issue in this campaign that's incredibly uh, important and I'm, I'm happy that's the case. Um, certainly all four elements that are being proposed today are incredibly important. And I would echo what uh, Councilman Ortiz said. I think there, there is a question of if someone with a police background um, would be able to serve or not. I think that those legalities need to be worked out. And I would also suggest that it may actually be a good thing if one or two of the seats on this independent police accountability board had the, the perspective of a former RPD member who maybe lives in the community, one of the, one of the rare ones that do. And certainly when it comes to investigation and subpoena, I think those without question are the critical pieces and I actually think they're less controversial. The hard one though is going to be the power to discipline. And I respectfully understand where uh, Councilmember Scott Miller came and said that those are things that are going to have to be negotiated. I would take a harder line. I would say that without question, if we have to give something up, that is what we don't give up. There is no teeth to this accountability board if there is not the ability to discipline. And in fact, in this study, in this study, which was so meticulously written, Syracuse is routinely used as the police accountability board that's doing good work. And yet the Syracuse board does not have the power to discipline. And it, doing some, some rudimentary searches this morning, it seems as though there are about 18% of the proposed cases that are actually being disciplined because it's ultimately the chief that has the opportunity to say yes or no to that. 18% is better than what we have in Rochester, but it's not enough. And so I would argue that number one, without question, we have got to fight for the power to discipline. Yeah. And as for the roadblock question, I hope that I get a chance to come back to it, I would just say I, I think this, this report is so powerful, not because it's a means to an end, because it's an opportunity to actually help to bridge police community relations, and there's a whole lot of other roadblocks that come with that. Thank you Thank so you. much. Uh, good evening. I'm Anthony Giordano running for City Council and I'm going to be on the ballot November 7th. So, um, I feel that uh, the independence of the board, it, it should be a fully independent, fully civilian-led board as far as the power to investigate. Um, they should be able to have full power of the board to be able to have full and separate investigative powers for subpoena power, uh, should have full power and be able to subpoena anyone related to any pending case. Um, the power of discipline, we should have, the board should have the full power to make and recommend any type of disciplinary actions deemed as appropriate and necessary. The roadblocks, I feel it's the willingness of city government to pass and implement this plan. Elect me because I am I'm in full support of this plan and this is exactly what Rochester needs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'm glad to see Delta Sigma Theta sorority involved here. It's, it's critical that we have uh, organizations like the Deltas and the other members of the Divine Nine sororities and fraternities involved because when we have a conversation like this, we cannot have it without having African Americans who are disproportionately affected by these issues as part of the conversation. Um, I, I think that this is a um, critical topic. The reason why it's important is because this disproportionately this affects the African-American community. In order to instill 
confidence in the broader community, and in particular in the African American community, we have to have something like this in order to instill that confidence. You know, black Americans, black African Americans um, are disproportionately affected when it comes to arrest, when it comes to drug use, when it comes to being arrested for all of the things that their white counterparts are. So this, this will not solve the structural problems in the criminal justice system, but it is an important first step. Of course there's going to be roadblocks. I've been working in government a long time, there's always roadblocks, but we have some brilliant people in this community and in this country that can help us work around the roadblocks to ensure that we can have confidence in, on both the police side as well as the community side, that if we put our heads together, we can come up with a good solution to build a strong system that makes everyone feel better um, about what we have to do in this community in order to strengthen our communities as it relates to community and police relations. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chris Eads, and I will also be in the, uh, on the ballot in the general election on November 7th. Uh, you know, the, the first thought that I had uh, when I was sitting here listening to people is I remember something that happened about 10 years ago. Uh, when I was younger, I kind of had a lead foot, and I was going through uh, 12 corners pretty fast. We had a red light, um, and I pulled over. And I happened to be listening to hip hop, and it had a pretty heavy bass line. So I think uh, the police officer had the wrong idea of who he would see in the driver's seat. Um, so he was walking up, like looking very angry, like he was about to, you know, to uh, tell me what for. Uh, then he gets up to the window, takes a look, sees who I am. I didn't have the tie on, but I was pretty much dressed like this. And it, his whole manner changed. He's, he's called me sir. He let me off with a warning. I mean, it, it was, I, I saw a complete 180 in his attitude, so, so don't let anyone tell you that race isn't a part of this. Um, so, yeah. so uh, you know, I, I'm also in, in agreement with the plan here. Um, I definitely think, you know, we need transparency, uh, we need accountability, we need subpoena power and power to discipline. Uh, let me add a few thoughts that uh, haven't been discussed. Um, I would also like to see us, uh, we can't, uh, state law prevents us from requiring police officers to live in the city, uh, but we can pay them a bonus for living in the city, which I think would go a long way because people need to live here in the city and they need to see how people live and, and understand and be a part of the community. Uh, in addition, uh, I realize there may be some issues with collective bargaining. Uh, one of the ways that we got here, actually, is during the 1980s, their uh, police departments were running low on money. And what they did in negotiations is they offered uh, basically participation in management instead of raises. So I don't have a problem with going back the other way and saying, okay, if you're going to give up this uh, disciplinary protections like we want, well, we can give you a raise in return. And so we are out of time, and we're going to move on. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to go to our last candidate now. Hello, everyone. How are you doing this evening? Right. Just fine? All right. I want to say thank you for everyone for putting this together. Uh, and I want to say, first off, I do agree with the uh, police accountability uh, suggestion. Uh, and I want to jump to what you talked about the day after. The day after, there are children out here crying. The day after, there are, there are young boys out here that are hurting. I, this is my old school, East High right here. I used to leave this school, I used to get harassed by the police all the time. Growing up, I work with young people day to day. We have to be strong as a community because when they look at us, when they see a young man getting beaten right in front of their very own eyes, and there's nothing that we can do to stop this or make a change or ask for that policeman to step down, we are not being accountable to our children. And we need to be. We need to think about the big shape our young black males, our young black females in this community to have that confidence, yeah. that strength to know, you know what, mama, you know what, mama, you got my back. And I know that the minute we step to that courthouse, when we step up to City Hall, you got my back. And I know that officer's going to pay for what he did to me, or my cousin, or my sister, or my friends in my neighborhood. So I want us to always stand tall and together to think about we are also accountable to our young people in this community. Thank you. Barbara's going to come up. Can we please give our panel a round of applause, please?
we thank you so much for those heartfelt responses and definitely for wearing my solar eclipse glasses. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bowie. Each of you has in your hand a um, piece of paper that has questions on it. And if you don't, you can raise your hand and a hostess will come down and give you um, a paper so you can write a question on it. We also have hostesses with baskets, and they will be coming down the aisle and collecting those. The uh, questions will be sorted by categories, and they will be presented to the facilitator. While that's occurring, um, Barbara Lassa Ware has a few additional things that she would like to add regarding the Independent Police Accountability Board. When we presented this, uh, our plan and proposal to City Council in April, they had some very, very good questions for us and, and concerns. And one of them was that the election of, we had an 11 member board. We were going to have one appointed by the mayor, four appointed by City Council, and six elected. They didn't like that. A lot of people didn't like that, so we've scrapped that in terms of our, what we're recommending. We have a committee that's the Ordinance Revision Committee that we've been meeting every other week for months, ever since April. And we're now recommending, and I think somebody mentioned it, maybe Matt uh, may have mentioned that we're now looking at having community representatives, six community representatives who will be selected by members of the community. Uh, who have supported this ordinance. So the election is off the table as far as we're concerned. We heard city council on that and wanted to respond. The other thing that, um, that people are talking about is the training issue and um, the issue of having to have a law enforcement uh, officer be on the board. There are lots of people who can be trained in investigations and understand law enforcement who, who are not police officers or former police officers. So there's plenty of people who can be tapped for that, and we're already looking at, we have one of our members of our committee who's looking at uh, civilian review processes all over the country to find out what their qualifications are, what their certifications are, so we can make sure that we have uh, the best uh, kind of job descriptions for those people, that, that both the staff people and the board people that don't have to be formal law enforcement. And finally, on that issue of training, there are three of us who are going to the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement's uh, annual conference to get more training next month. And we hope to come back and be able to give anyone who wants to know, especially city council members, some insights onto what we've learned about training. This is the premier or organization of civilian oversight. There's 200 different members of civilian oversight groups in the country that will be at this uh, training and we're hoping to, to get some good insights on that. Finally, um, Oakland, California is our new poster child that we're looking to because Oakland, California has disciplinary power. They have all the things that we mentioned and they have disciplinary power. So if you want to do some research, look at Oakland, California. They're just getting their process going. They approved it via ballot measure by 86% back in November. So much. For those of you who haven't had an opportunity to actually read the report, I would strongly suggest that you take the time and read the report. It really gives a really in-depth background. And so as we transition into the next part of our program, and I have some more questions for the candidates, I would like to once again thank my sorority sisters of Delta Sigma Theta sorority. These are the beautiful women you see in red and white. Our chapter president, Melanie J. Cyrus, and the 22 women that founded our sorority in 1913. It was because of their community's acts that we are here today with a dedication to social action. And so throughout this report, there are case studies. And the sisters of Delta Sigma Theta, we like to give you gifts, so I'm going to give you a new pair of lenses in which I'd like you to wear as I present the next set of questions. And this is a case study from the report. It is the case of Shakira and Jamar, Carolyn Sinclair's children. On March 31st, 2005, 
Carolyn Sinclair's 12-year-old daughter, Shakira. Let me repeat that, because I think some of you might have 12-year-old daughters. 12-year-old daughter, Shakira, was verbally harassed by RPD officer Robert Cortez. When her brother, Jamar, tried to call the police, Cortez slapped the phone from his hand. Officer Timothy Wright and other officers grabbed Jamar, threw him to the ground, and kicked him. Cortez called him an asshole and said he couldn't stand niggas like you. Then officers pepper sprayed and arrested Jamar. Shakira picked up her brother's cell phone and called her stepfather. Officers threw her to the ground, pepper sprayed, and arrested her. Both children were treated at the hospital. The charges against them were later dismissed. The family was then stalked and harassed by RPD officers. Sinclair filed a civil rights claim and the family received monetary compensation. Cortese is no longer serving on the RPD. Wright remains an officer. The day after. What's going on with those kids today? To address this gap in funding. Mr. Dunwood. Thank you. In order to address this gap in funding, me being a uh, city council member, I would look at ways that we, we could actually use some of our resources that we have available. Uh, looking at our budgets, looking at our recreation centers where a lot of our young people are attending so they can actually have a trauma connection with people. We have individuals like Pathways to Peace that are out on the streets trying to help console uh, these young individuals. We need a better support system for child care to make this happen in our neighborhoods. So let's look at our physical resources we actually have at first, and then let's look at how we extend our budget to child care to make these things stronger for our neighbors, for our residents, so that these trauma-affected uh, uh, young people have a place to go that they feel safe, welcome, warmed, and protected. Thank you. Thank you. Can you pass the mic? Chris is here. Uh, there, there's a lot of things that we could do um, in the city budget if we rearranged our priorities. Uh, right now, I mean, we give out about $40 million in corporate welfare every year to large corporations and wealthy developers that already have lots of money. Um, you know, if you, meanwhile, you drive down Lake Avenue and the, the roads are in pretty bad condition. Um, you know, we, the child care is definitely something that's, that's important, and it's certainly within our, within our ability to provide that, along with you know, increasing hours for recreation centers and, and uh, libraries and generally providing uh, the basic services that the city is supposed to be providing when it's you know, not handing out money to people that already have it. So I definitely think there's room in the budget for that if our priorities are straight. Thank you. One of the things we were, we were able to do with pre-K funding, we were able to get more pre-K funding in Rochester because the community rallied around it. You remember years ago we didn't have three-year-olds in pre-K, we didn't have almost universal pre-K. We now have that because the community made it a priority. We lobbied the state and we got more funds for that. We need to do the same thing around child care. I know I got little kids. I know how expensive child care is. It is an extremely expensive proposition and it's particularly important for lower income individuals because they, they have lesser income and more of their money may be going to child, to child care. And then the, the county is set up in such a way where they are penalized that they are trying to get a ladder out of poverty if they start working and doing anything. So, so, so the city has to work with all levels of government in order to increase child care funding. Don't get caught up by any gimmicks or any, 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 there's no silver bullets there. It takes hard work, but if it's a priority for this community, we can make it happen. We have to make sure that we, you hold the city council members accountable, county legislators accountable, and more importantly, our state representatives who really control the purse strings as it relates to child care funding and subsidies in Monroe County, but it can be done. things that I'd like to do with kids, it, it is a matter of funding, is increase the recreation and library hours. They'll have a safe place to go, and it would help. I think they would be a lot safer in the libraries or in the recreation centers uh, than out on the streets with all these police that like to beat them up. 
So um, that's one way that I think would really help our kids. So more funding to those things would indirectly help the kids and their needs. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, my name is Mitch Gruber. Uh, first and foremost, we absolutely need to advocate at the county level and the state level for increased child care subsidies and costs. There's no questions asked. And I will tell you that from one, one thing I personally believe and I talk about on the door every day is that one of the ways we win these arguments that we've lost for years at a time is by getting new people involved, new people with new negotiating skills, new people with different perspectives to bring to council. And I, I work at Foodlink, I have had to negotiate with state and county on many issues, and we've largely been successful on, on, on a lot of these issues. So one is just negotiating, one is advocacy. But the other piece is that I work a lot with places like Child Care Council and the Route to Child First Network, which both are the umbrella organizations that look over all the in-home daycares throughout our community. And there are huge amounts of savings, there's huge amounts of opportunities to help those organizations help in-home daycare providers further. I see this every day on a food perspective with the Child and Adult Care Feeding Program. These in-home daycare providers that are serving six, seven, eight kids have very little ability to go do anything what we go do when it comes to buying food. They go shop retail. And when you're shopping retail, you don't have the ability to stretch your dollars further when you're serving six to eight kids. We can figure out how to unify those organizations and how to provide them with the skills and the tool belt necessary to stretch their dollar further, which is one thing we can do on a local level and hasn't really been tried yet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, again, my name is Dorian Hall, and what I would do is work with Community Development Black Block Club Grant Funds. These are federal funds that are given to every city. They give them out for four years. City of Rochester receive those funds. I will tap into those and subsidize people looking for child care help. Um, and I would also tap into the poverty funds. We know Rochester receives a lot of poverty money, so I would use those funds to subsidize any child care. Thank you. Hello, uh, Tom Hasman. So I agree with what a lot's been said, so instead of just kind of regurgitating, since there's so many of us, uh, I'll take the time to offer uh, something different that hasn't been said yet. When I was president of the ABC Streets Neighborhood Association, we started a program called Help a Neighbor. We discovered that we had some elderly neighbors that couldn't no longer rake their leaves or shovel their driveway. So we started listing people in the neighborhood and the skills that they had, and we started exchanging services for free. No money exchanged hands. So we know there's, always, there's a cut of funding. We're always looking for new funding. But this could be an outside-the-box way if we incorporate this in neighborhoods where we might have a grandmother or grandfather perhaps that's home during the day that might say, sure, I'll be able to watch the kids for a few hours. And then maybe that weekend the kids come over and perhaps help rake leaves or mow the grass. So that's a great solution that doesn't cost any money allows neighbors to get to know each other better, and can help uh, provide even services to families. Thank you. Once again, I'm Matt Judah. Um, we've heard a lot about conversations with the budget. I think the first thing we need to make a point of is the fact that between the city school district and the city, there was a $70 million gap that had to be closed. Most of those were done, at least on the city school district, on through efficiencies. If you look seven years out, that gap's is projected to be about $140,000, or 100, I'm sorry, $140 million. We have a serious money problem. So saying we're gonna move money from here to there is not that simple. It seems like the simplest solution to the problem, but it's not. What we really need to do, and what I'll do on city council, is I will advocate with the state, with our local representatives at the state level to ensure that we get our fair share. I will advocate with the county, which constantly goes right after our children. It's the first thing they do, is they cut money from children's programs. And we need to start pushing our Democratic colleagues in the county legislature to say, yeah, you're a minority, but we gotta do what we gotta do for our kids. And lastly, I think we need to work more closely as a council with the city school district. We've worked together on grants in the past and they've been successful. We've gotten the money for preschool because of community grants. We need to continue doing that and look more into those things. In terms of a recreation program, I worked for recreation for 10 years. I would advocate for an entire 
evaluation of the entire recreation system so that we can implement things such as more youth programming, more senior programming, and adult programming, in addition to expanding hours. Because we know that's one area that we struggle to compete with our suburban neighbors, and it's one area that we could possibly find solutions for child care. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm a Blue Lightfoot, and I want to say that I was on the college legislature for 10 years as assistant minority leader in the minority. And I can tell you, we fought. One of the things that was so dear to my heart, time after time after again, I see Sister Grace sitting in the, in the audience, as uh, well as fighting for uh, One of the things that we did on a consistent basis is fight for our children and fight for money for them. Here's the issue. We have to have an outcry from this community. As much as we do for police accountability, we have to have an outcry because this, this is the issue. We got a lot of money. They stole our money. They stole the money. So the, the one of the things that we need to realize is how much money did you steal? It's not so much that we want to get more money. What are we doing with the current money that we already have? Hi. Why is nobody outcry about people going to jail and stealing our money, our tax, hard earned dollars? We got to ask for accountability for that money, especially from the, from the county legislature. Because that money was stolen. Don't make no mistake about it. Okay? We have asked for accountability for what we're doing currently with the money now, and then be fiscally responsible for going forward with the money that's coming to us currently right now. As city council person, I will lead that charge a community outcry for our children. Thank you. But as we talked about, it's not necessarily that we can find the money at the city level, but we also have to make this change at the county. As we discussed, it's not moving our Democratic colleagues at the county level to move on child care because they have been fighting for this. You all have been fighting for this. These postcards that you see, they were done for child care too. I stood on Main Street. We stretched from the, from the county office building all the way over across the bridge with those postcards. But the Republicans do not have to listen to us because they have the majority. And Sister Grace knows because she talks every meeting about this. We have 100,000 more Democrats registered in Monroe County. There is no excuse. We have to stand up and elect leaders at the county level that will stand with our families. Hi, I'm, I'm Dana Miller, and uh, that is exactly one of the points that we really need to focus on. But when we focus on the county, we also have to focus on this problem that causes child care supports to be reduced as a person makes more money. That is really the biggest structural problem that we have to fix. You can't penalize somebody for working harder to make their life better by taking supports away from them. They can't just be a cliff. There's got to be a graduated scale in some way of not making people lose those supports. So that's really what we need to focus on. And we can't really focus on trying to take more money from city residents, because if you increase the taxes on city residents, what you're doing, again, is you're taking money away from the people who need the money, because their rent goes up, their, their other costs go up, so they're still back behind where they should have been. So we've got to get money from the county. We have to get money from the state. We even have to get money from the federal government. But we've got to make sure that when people need help, they don't lose the help because they've made more money. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Jackie Ortiz. Um, I would absolutely echo some of the things that were already stated here, and I would even like to enhance that even further. We spent a lot of time and effort, clearly because we live here in the city on our city elections, but the amount of effort and, and, and attention that we put on, we need to put that just as much in our suburban races. Because without the support of people actually helping some of our Democratic candidates, they will never win. And so we need to make sure that we are supporting them and putting as much effort behind them as well in order for them to win those seats so we can actually have the majority that we really have as a population here in this county. Additionally, we have a partnership between our city school district, our county legislature, and our city council. We have our 333 committee. We meet on a regular basis. And some of the things we all are already currently doing we are already developing a partnership with members of the Children's Agenda, which is an advocacy agency here, to already take on some of those issues on how we are able to advocate for additional dollars and put them in the right places. Additionally, we are taking a look at opportunities 
for us to share better information. Many times we have duplicative services and we're not necessarily handling our resources the right way. So we're taking a look at that. And finally, one of the things, because we have some of our county members at the table, our, our Young Mothers Program. Many times they are specifically the ones that we need to make sure they finish their educations and are the ones that have those child care subsidies. So we are trying to prioritize, finding a way to make sure that the subsidies that are given, that we prioritize uh, women like that in our program to make sure they are the ones that get the subsidies so they can finish their education and not continue to repeat the vicious cycle. And finally, here. Barney Radford, issue of gap funding. Um, I'm not a politician, so I'm going to just give you a, a quick, you know, straight, normal answer. Just what you do at home. When you, have, when you have your money and you know you're short, you start trying to pull it or reduce spending on, on certain things. Um, one thing that I do know is silver servants work for the people. And there is no reason that civil servants are getting paid more than the medium income yeah. of the community they serve. So if you're going to uh, pull funding, if you, or you gotta have this, this, this funding met, start there, because there's no reason for it. Everybody is poor in this community, well not everybody in this community is poor, but I'm saying, I mean, if, there's, if, if there is such an economic problem here, Start at the top. Well, the, the elected officials are supposed to be responsible and start with them first. So that's how you put that money. Loretta Scott. Uh, I want to um, echo a number of the comments that were made so far, particularly as it relates to the county's support of child care funding. Allocations are made at a number of levels and Invariably, the county does not allocate the full amount that is provided to them for child care services. They don't do it. So if we can get some, some heat, some additional heat, uh, and attention, and sustained heat, that may help us move that, move that needle. Additionally, it's not just child care, it's early childhood education. So as much as you want to think that neighbors may be able to watch your kids, I don't want every neighbor to watch my kid. Right. So we have done a lot to increase the number of early childhood education spots. At one point, there was only about 15 to 20 percent of the children in our communities who were in programs of that sort. Now, I think it's somewhere up around 85 percent. So as much as we want to increase child care, we also have to keep our eye on early childhood education and not let that slip. Thank you so much. Now we're getting ready to transition into the very exciting part of the night. And this is your questions. These are your questions and these are your day afters. And the first question is being asked of Miss Mary Lupian. And the question is bias training. How frequent would this bias training be? Is it yearly? Uh, that's, a good, that's a great question. I think we need to look to other cities and how they've instituted this. Um, I don't know if yearly is nearly enough, and you know we have to keep up with new recruits and make sure that everyone's getting this training on the schedule. And it's probably not just a three-hour training. This is something that's got to build, because looking inside and breaking down that racial bias that's been programmed in all of us is going, it's going to take time. Um, but it's definitely something that we need to look into and that's worth looking into. Thank you. The next question is on education. It's being directed to Ms. Loretta Scott. Can you provide an update on the superintendent's plan to improve Rochester City School District, specifically related to claims around illegal practices in special education laws and services for, I can't make this out, students? What is council's role in accountability for school improvement in Rochester? I don't think I have the answer to that. Okay. I'm not sure of what the superintendent's plan is. I mean, we work closely with the school district, but what they submit to us 
is a budget that's about, I don't know, 600 pages. And uh, we can vote it up or we can vote it down. We do not have any authority to make any changes therein. So we don't go into debt that was on a number of those um, issues. Thank you. So we believe that needs to change. Are you asking for? That's the change. The city council can't monitor what our schools are doing. We got so many schools that are closing in the school district. I'm a father of six children. If you you're telling me that you don't know what the school what the school board is doing. Okay. I understand all that. I'm, I'm a former student of Franklin High School, class of 97, Miss Scott. You know, but here's the thing. As a father of six children in this city, you're going to tell me that I you don't know. The city council does not know where our taxes are going for our schools, but yet our schools are closing. East High School, I used to play football. Russell against is now ran by the UFR. What is that doing for Franklin that you guys have allowed six or seven different schools to go in one building? You're not helping out our children. You're making it worse. And, and yet, you're asking for my election, my vote. Come on, now you're talking to the voters. Y'all need to come more prepared than, than these I don't knows. I can't tell my children I don't know where their nerves coming at night. What I can tell you is that the city council has no authority over the school district other than voting their budget up or down. Thank you so much. And we understand your passion. And we want to make sure that you use that energy to direct it to somebody that can make that change. So we need to make sure that your thoughts and your day after gets articulated. Because what you're saying is the current format that asks for a yay or nay needs to probably have a little bit more power. All right? So let's do that. Let's put some teeth in your act and make sure that we're asking the right person to make a change. Because if you come and ask me to cook dinner, it ain't happening. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to the next question, and this is education. This is going to Mr. Malik Evans. How would you feel about military school or giving guns to security guards inside of schools? Um, our, our kids, there's something called the school prison pipeline. Yep. Yeah. That um, I'm not in favor of giving guns to any security guards uh, in school. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm not in favor of that. Um, we do need to make sure we build good community relations with them. Peter W. Peters. Peter, P E T E R W. Peters, P E T E R S. What do you think of the meeting? I thought it went very well. Okay, let's try this again and elaborate it. Ready? What do All you right. think of the meeting? I'm, I'm very Im impressed with the uh, number of people who turned out. I'm absolutely amazed at the cards all around the hall. I hope you're photographing them. And I'm excited that there was such a support for police accountability. I recognize that there are some serious issues that existing members of the council are aware of as they try to process this uh, proposed ordinance, but my hope is that they'll get behind it and that we'll see a new ordinance in the very near future. 